Hello, welcome to the tutorial Deciphering History. My name is Dr. Melissa Esmacher and I'm a professor of history at El Paso Community College Northwest Campus. In this tutorial, we'll discuss how history is written and give you guidance on how to develop your skills of analysis as budding historians who have papers due this semester. First, we have to ask, what is history? Well, very broadly, History is the study of the past. Most classes emphasize the human experience. If you want the history of the universe or of the physical earth, there are science classes for that. So what do historians use to write history? When a historian sits down to write something like your textbook, they don't just pull stuff magically out of their head. Instead, they analyze many different types of evidence to craft a historical narrative, like your textbook or a history class lecture. Let's look at the types of evidence historians use. The biggest and most obvious is written evidence. Have you ever heard of the term prehistory? For a long time, historians defined history as only occurring after the invention of writing, and anything before that was considered before history. Most modern historians don't have that same bias, but written evidence remains important. There are three types of written evidence. The first is a primary source. Primary sources date to the time period that is being studied and can be produced by the people that we are studying. Some examples include government documents, letters, journals, newspapers, books, literature, diaries, even something as mundane as receipts can give a historian a lot of, of, his, of history. The second type of written evidence is a secondary source. This is produced at a later time than the time period studied, but it describes the time period we're studying. Some examples of secondary sources include scholarly books and articles, as well as things like your textbook. The third type of written evidence, tertiary sources, will not be as useful to you. A tertiary source is just a compilation of primary and secondary sources, like an encyclopedia entry or a list, that doesn't go into very much depth. Another type of evidence historians use is physical evidence. Physical evidence can be created by humans, such as art, photography, objects, and buildings. Physical evidence can also be shaped or influenced by humans, such as landscapes. Think of battlefields or archaeological sites. Human and animal remains are also helpful types of evidence. Physical evidence is especially important for ancient history before the introduction of written records. Historians often gather this evidence from other disciplines, for example, archaeology. The sciences have been increasingly helpful to historians for determining dates with things like radiocarbon dating, or past environments, like the use of dendrochronology, which is the study of tree rings to determine age and environmental conditions. These disciplines help historians piece together more about the past. The last major type of evidence used by historians is oral evidence, which is evidence produced by humans and using language, but language that is unwritten. Examples of oral evidence include music, songs and chants, oral stories, and interviews. Oral history is especially important for studying cultures without writing systems because many of those cultures maintained oral histories that they passed down from generation to generation, like the Hawaiians passing down genealogy via memorized chants. Many historians have collected these oral histories and written them down, like the woman in this image obtaining an oral history from a Native American man in the early 1900s. So now that we've looked at the three major types of evidence, written, physical, and oral, let's look at some problems we run into with evidence and how to overcome them. Sometimes you will run into problems in analyzing evidence. The biggest problem is missing pieces. We can have missing pieces for a number of reasons. Sometimes people purposefully destroy evidence for a variety of reasons. Think shredding documents, burning stuff, etc. Mother Nature is a big destroyer of evidence too, because evidence can decay due to the elements. Think for example about paper. It's very biodegradable, which means that if it, it survives for a much shorter period of time than, say, stone. 
So we might have a lot of stone tablets with writing from ancient Mesopotamia, but very little writing on papyrus from ancient Egypt. Sometimes evidence is inaccessible to us due to physical impediments or modern geopolitics. For example, some ancient sites now are reclaimed by the ocean because of the change in sea levels, or some sites might be inaccessible due to hostile governments or warfare. Evidence might also not be understandable. There are still some writing systems that historians have not been able to decipher, like the written language of ancient Harappa. Or, we might not have enough context to analyze a source. It's an inside joke among historians and archaeologists that if we don't fully understand the purpose of an object, we just say that it must be for a ritual purpose. Missing pieces of evidence are usually incredibly difficult to overcome. Other problems you might have with evidence include separating fact from fiction, which is particularly problematic for literature, diaries, and memoirs, all of which might be altered for artistic license or to depict someone in a better light. Bias is another problem. Bias is a perspective or opinion that influences writing, speech, and action, and can drastically affect the way the document is created and how we interpret it. So that brings us to our next point. How do we overcome problems with evidence? You can start by asking questions about your source that might help clarify things, like why might the author hold this view? Or why does the author approach the topic this way? These questions are very helpful in determining bias. You should always check your observations with context, which will help sift through any problems separating fact from fiction. Check your observations of the source against knowledge you already have. For example, does your reading of the source fit with what your instructor talked about in class? Then, you should always go the extra step to look up extra information about the source. This is where you can consult secondary sources, like scholarly articles, to get expert opinions on the context of the source. After asking questions about the source and checking your observations with context, you should then be able to draw some conclusions about your source. But there's one more thing we should talk about, and that's your role in analyzing the evidence. Everybody has a bias that will affect how we look at a source and how we interpret it. This isn't a bad thing. What is bad is when you aren't aware of what your bias is. You can take some steps to understand your own bias by asking questions. One is to understand how you are, how who you are can shape how you think. What aspects of my identity might contribute to my viewpoint helps you to understand how your personal traits, such as age, gender, social class, environment, religion, politics, family, etc., etc., can cause you to view a source differently from classmates with different traits. Similarly, your past experiences can shape how you view a source by giving you prior knowledge to compare to the source. For example, your work experience, education, travel, etc. can change how you approach and analyze a source. The reason we try to understand these biases is so we can more easily understand why someone else might analyze things differently than we do. This not only increases our understanding of others, but it can help you form stronger written arguments. More on that in a later tutorial. Now, let's talk about how to analyze a source. When analyzing a source, I always recommend that you read or observe it first, before you look at any supporting information. This will help to train you how to analyze a source. I also recommend that you try to look at a source in different ways so you can make the most sense of it. When you look at a source, you should ask the W questions to help you determine the basics of a source. Who wrote or created the source? What is going on in the source? When was this source created? Where does this take place? And most importantly, why is this source important? In other words, what use does this source have to us in crafting a historical narrative? You should also make note of anything in the source that you find particularly unusual or interesting. Now, let's put some of this into practice by analyzing a physical source. The next slide will have an image of a source. Let's see what you observe. I'm going to be quiet for a minute so you can 
take a look at the source and start to make observations on your own. Ready? Let's go. Okay, so now that you've had a bit of time to look at the source, you've probably noticed that it is a photograph and it isn't full color. Both of these details can help us date the source. It can't be any older than the invention of photography in the mid-19th century, and the lack of color implies that it's probably not recent. Let's look at the details of the scene. We can tell we're in a city. There are big buildings and public transportation in the form of streetcars. There are also cars. That helps us date the source too, since it has to be after cars were invented. We can also probably narrow the date down even further by the style of the car. And I haven't even mentioned the explosion in the middle of this scene. This is clearly not a normal day in the city. You might also have noticed that the only human in the shot, who's here, seems to be running away from the explosion, like any sane person would. We've managed to observe a lot already. Now this is where we go and look for context. This is a picture of Detroit in 1943 during a race riot. We would have difficulty guessing that a riot is going on in this scene because we don't see a lot of people. We also might have interpreted the fleeing man as running away from an explosion that he set. But when we look at more information about the 1943 Detroit riot, we find that African Americans were pulled off of streetcars and beaten so it's now possible to potentially interpret the man as fleeing from violence. You can practice some of these skills of analysis further by looking at the primary sources in your textbook, if you have them, or on the internet. The more you sharpen your skills of analysis, the better you will do in your assignments this semester. If you have any questions about sources used in history, consult your history instructor or your favorite local librarian. Thanks and have a great rest of your day.